In the beginning, it was Adam and Eve's privilege to rule with God. In other words, they were stewards of God's creation. And their ability to steward was dependent on their relationship with the owner. And at the core of that relationship was worship. This morning I want to attempt to try to give some content to the concept of worship. Worship is a relationship to something or someone more than it is an activity that we perform. A relationship more than it is an activity that we perform. God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into him the breath of life. And Adam, man, became a living being. And the moment that Adam became conscious, his eyes were open to look into the face of his creator. There was no question who was the source of his life. The innocent and natural response can, nothing, can be nothing else except thanksgiving. And it's thanksgiving is what initiates worship. Of 
What do you feel when you look up into the sky and see the stars? What do you feel when you walk through the valley of Tama? And you look on the Trigo or some other mountain top. Nothing else except wonder and awe. And you get a little bit of an understanding of how, of how big the Creator must be. And how small we are in comparison. And in the heart is birth a proper humility. David understood this because he said, When I look into the heavens and I see the stars, and I think, Oh, what is man that you would think on us? Thanksgiving, awe and humility. When Adam received the first commandment, he said, Multiply, subdue, steward, the privilege of responsibility. <laughs> Who said that's a privilege? <laughs> responsibility, privilege. <laughs> That's not my responsibility. God was giving Adam and Eve work, a responsible reason for living. And the, mag the magnitude of their responsibility created the need for help and dependency. <laughs> Not that kind of obesity. <laughs> but the right kind of being dependent. We've said this before. Almost all addictions, the, the core issue is. is who am, who am I dependent on? We all have challenges. And Adam knew the challenge that was before him. And it created a sense of dependency, true worship the expression of dependency upon God. Adam also heard one restriction that was put upon him. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Not only was responsibility given to Adam, but now accountability was expected from Adam. And obedience to God would serve as the final and ultimate response to true worship. Obedience to God would serve as the final and ultimate response through worship in Christ. So Adam walked with God in a relationship that was based on thanksgiving, humility, awe, dependency, and obedience. These are the essence of true worship. These qualities take us far beyond a half hour 
of seed on a Sunday morning. These qualities include our entire life. Has more to do with how we live from Monday through Saturday. And in this relationship, all of Adam's needs were fulfilled. Purpose permeated their days. Satisfaction and security came from this harmony that came from the relationship they had with God and their environment. Worship was at the core of their well-being. And that well-being depended on the proper flow of worship. What happened? Well, we know. Snake comes into the garden and deceives. And when Adam and Eve disobeyed, their well-being became immediately affected. Their, they obeyed the serpent's lie. And they transferred their trust and forfeited their stewardship to the deceiver. And the corruption of their worship resulted in the corruption of everything. God was their source of life and wholeness. But as soon as they transferred their loyalty to the serpent, they were introduced to the source of death, disease, and destruction. Adam and not only experienced a breakdown in their relationship to God, but they also experienced a corruption in their ability to steward. And it's here, most likely, because of their failure, that Satan became the god of this world's system. As Paul points out in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In one sense, all that we know about evil can, can be traced back to this one incident. The moment man transferred his loyalty away from God, his world became corrupt, confused and condemned. And the blending of man's rejection of God's purpose and Satan's purpose to destroy can account for much of the evil that we see in our world But how was Adam and Eve's relationship with God affected? And in, and in what way was their stewardship corrupted? In order for us to understand how glorious Jesus' restoration is, we have to understand what was lost from the beginning. And even though the idea of rulership or stewardship sounds, sounds a little foreign or lofty somewhere in the sky, 
It is actually very practical. And it has implications for us every day. Because a, a person's failure to acknowledge him to declare their loyalty to Jesus Christ is what disturbs the divine order. So what was lost? The first thing is that man lost his righteous relationship with God. Adam's disobedience opened their consciousness to evil and wrongdoing. And there was a flood of guilt and condemnation connected with their sin. And the only response Adam and Eve could think of was to do what? They hid themselves. There's a lot of hiding people in the world. A sense of guilt and condemnation drives them to find, to find ways to, to hide their truth. In what was once a relationship of love and closeness now becomes a relationship of fear and distance. And they try to cover themselves with their own fig leaves. Here's the description we have in Genesis chapter 3. Source of pain and conflict. 
Managing a household would no longer become a simple task. And rather than a couple working, working together under God's management would now become enemies to each other. And their inability to find harmony and work together with God would give the enemy access to their children. Number three. Uh, uh, 
tým materiálom sú žvárske pole, kde páči prekryvaná. And God changed their fig leaves to an animal skin. Yes, the very first sacrifice for sin was already accomplished. And from that time, the world has been, has been occupied the more. Exchanging all the ways we attempt to present ourselves. It's defiled worship is what corrupted our relationship with God. And our stewardship was drastically affected. But the good news is, is that with restored worship, that is the pathway to redeem and get back not only our relationship with God, but with an ability to steward what God has given to us. That is why the devil wants to keep every single individual from true worship. That's why he wants to keep this community and every other community darkened from learning the potential that exists in free honest and passionate worship of God. The thanksgiving, the humility, the awe, the dependency, and the obedience that is at the core of real relationship with God. Too often the Christian community is considered worship. As an obligation to be performed. Rather than a gift to be cherished. Because worship has less to do with the songs that we sing. But it has everything to do with the condition of our heart. And it's not surprising that the devil confronted Jesus in the wilderness that worship was a core issue. You want to rule? You want to be a steward of everything? I'll give you all of this. Just bow down and worship me. Declare your dependency on me. Put your trust in me. Obey me. Jesus said, uh-uh. Uh-uh. What was his answer? You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. And Jesus' determination to keep God at the core of his life was pivotal to his mission. Jesus stood firm. And the second Adam denied what the first Adam did not. And because Jesus obeyed God completely, perfectly, 
all the way to giving his life on the cross. And it was that sacrifice, that act of worship, would become the source of, of restoring everything that sin had corrupted. Why is worship important? Why is it important that MKS is a worshiping community? And I'm not talking about the songs we sing. I'm talking about a lifestyle of thanksgiving. A lifestyle of humility and awe. A lifestyle of dependency. And a church that still believes that it's important to obey God. <laughs> Thank you for those hearty amens. <laughs> what did Jesus sacrifice do? This morning, this morning we celebrate the Lord's Supper. What is it about? In his sacrifice, in our willingness to receive that sacrifice as the penalty for our sin, our willingness to acknowledge him as the one who paid the price for us in that acknowledgement we receive the freedom and dominion over condemnation and worship opens our heart to receive God's grace and His love in ever-growing measures. Amen. And that friendship is restored. The barrier that once separated us is now removed. And instead of there being now distance and fear between us, there is now a bond, a covenant, a closeness that can never be taken from us. Listen, friends, we are a long way from discovering even the tip of the iceberg of God's love and grace. And God is looking for people who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Those very words were spoken to an immoral woman. But Jesus saw the need of her heart. And he was welcoming her away from her emptiness. To be filled with a love that satisfies and, and a grace that abundantly forgives. Paul says it this way, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is now therefore no, no condemnation. No condemnation. Wow. Secondly, you receive the, the, the harmony and the order to be restored in relationships, in homes and families. Whenever, whenever thanksgiving, humility and wonder, dependency and obedience are given to God, something happens also between a husband and wife. Marriage 
marriages begin to change for the better in homes where the spirit of worship exists God you are God you are important God we, we depend on you you are our source you can have worship music on in the background and having none of that going on in the culture Hillsong can play all day long. I'm a long play on your YouTube channel. But when worship returns, you can have it going on all, all day long, but without the worship we're talking about, a dependency on him and all of him, a thanksgiving. That worship cannot replace the decisions that we have to make every day. It won't replace the accusing finger. But when a hand is up raised to God, it's very hard to point the finger at the same time. The accusing finger turns into an up, an upturned hand toward Him. The hand that once struck out in anger now stretches out to comfort and console. Words that were once sharp and spoken to hurt a partner turns to compliments. Wow. I needed that great. I'm so thankful for you. Thank you for cooking lunch. Thanks for filling the gas tank. The fear and the complaints that often occur from a so-called lack of money are easily silenced through thanksgiving and praise to God for what he has given. And he releases a creativity through that thankfulness to give us the ability to earn more. Which leads to our third that there's a fulfillment and a security that's da, restored to our finances. Uh, so whenever the principles of worship and our finances are applied, so, uh, our work takes on a new quality. So that, what, so that what was once just a little now becomes sufficient to meet our needs. Tithing, acknowledging God's ownership, cuts the heart off from dependency on money. Stewardship and giving release us from the spirit of acquiring. Thanksgiving and dependence upon God are critical for our economic well being. Philippians 4.19 is a beautiful promise. All of us are familiar with this verse. 
that says, ki pravi moj Bog, bogatka korije, bo po svojem bogatstvu v veličastvu potešil vse vaše potrebe v Hristu so Jezusu. Isn't that a great promise? A ni to krasno. Great promise. Super bila. Often we lift this verse out of its context. In which was given. And starting in verse 10. In which was given. Paul commends the Philippian church for their giving, for their generosity, on, on more than one occasion. They sent gifts that were a help to Paul in his particular need. Even though he says, you know, I, I've learned to be content. Sometimes I've had a lot. Sometimes I've had a little. But I've learned to be content in every situation. And I'm not after your gift, he says. But I'm excited about the profit that comes to you. Because of your generosity. Woo. In fact, in verse 18, Paul describes that He calls it a fragrant offering. And, and an acceptable sacrifice. What kind of language is that? What are these pictures of? Bonyale. These are all Old Testament sacrifices that were offered up, incense that was burned in the temple. These are terms of worship. And Paul describes their giving as an act of worship. The act of worship of the Philippian church opened a door to the very source of all blessings. And Paul says, Philippian church, you gave but you will also receive. Mika mentioned this morning about getting it. How many of you have ever heard of a Pentecostal handshake? Does anybody know that? I'm, okay. I'm going to demonstrate it this morning. A Pentecostal handshake. Mika, would you come? Okay. You're going to be blessed again this morning. Yeah. In, in the in the old days, which, which I find extremely encouraging, because there was a culture among Pentecostal churches in particular of generosity. So when people would come together in a meeting, someone would come to you to give you a handshake. But, but, their, but their hand wasn't empty. Instead, there was a piece of paper in their hand. And this became known in, in, in Pentecostal culture as a Pentecostal handshake. Now, me, had we been, had we been aware of that of that culture, as they would used to say, hey, this morning I got a Pentecostal handshake. And the person re releases what was in their hand to the other person. That's it. Thank you.
picture of how people among the community are generous towards one another. I'm telling you that sends up that sends up a, a sweet fragrance that God is not sure. And he breathes that in. Oh, wow. That's, that smells fabulous. Huh? Have you ever come to someone's home and they're cooking and you come into the house and you can smell the onions and you can smell the meat and potatoes that are on the stove and you go, oh, wow. That's what God does. That's how he feels. And when you and I are generous, there is a God who is more than happy to want to be generous with you. Because God loves joyful givers. Obviously, we don't give to get. We give because we've already gotten. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. That's what Pentecostals say. Amen. Yeah, preach it. That's good stuff. <laughs> and the final thing that Jesus restores when we worship him. Thanksgiving. Humility. Awe. Acknowledge our dependence. And our desire to obey Him. There's a sense of personal well being. A, a mental. Physical. Emotional and spiritual well-being that's restored. It's what the Bible calls the promise of life. Jesus said, Jesus said the enemy, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I come to give you what? Life. And what kind? Like, like a baby. He's not talking about the eternal life. Like something that's still in my future life. No, he's, I'm coming to give him life. So that there is a mental, a physical, and, and a, an emotional sense of wellness that comes when Jesus has access to our inner life. When you find a community that worships with purpose and understanding, you'll find a, a community that's bubbling with life. Meaning that there's a sense of, of love affirmation understanding compassion and joy it's what the Bible declares in other places when one person weeps when one rejoices See, you. God puts the lonely in the family. He gives to us the well-being that comes from being connected with God and with people who appreciate us, who value us who accept us. You see, worship allows what, what we have to come to heaven 
And what heaven has to come to us. Worship brings us into a greater consciousness of, of his presence so that his peace, his healing, his hope fulfilled view of our tomorrow and his joy can flow like a river from his throne to our heart. When you walk with Miha and Vesna, you're gonna see, you, you will always pass for sure a river. And in order to get from one side of the river to the other, because that river will not stop for you. It just keeps flowing and flowing and flowing. And if God could open our eyes this morning, He'd like to give you an awareness that your well-being is absolutely dependent on the flowing of that river to you. It has much to do with the people who are around you. And more about the person who is above you. Maybe even better the person who is in you. And his river wants to flow to you this morning. To help you be a steward of the life that he's given to you. To celebrate the friendship that you have with him. That he is restored to us. No condemnation. No distance. Instead, friendship. We're in life together, we're yoked. And he gives us an ability. With time, it's a skill that we learn to live with other people. This is not easy. I'm not saying that this is a simple task. But God releases a, a wisdom, a compassion, a help so that we don't make the mistake of looking at flesh and blood as our enemy. As Paul points out, our battle isn't here. Yes? Mogoče nimamo sograsje. Mogoče se ne sprinjimo. You're not my enemy. And I'm not yours. Can we figure out how to, how despite our differences, Reason being is because we, we both have the same father. And when God is in the house, he wants his sons and his daughters. <laughs> All the parents in the house know what I'm talking about. They can get loud with each other.
each other. They like, we'll crash it down. But we're still part of the same family. And I'm going to keep my heart <laughs> from the kinds of things that would that would also poison me and poison <laughs> our relationship. He brings the ability for us to be able to manage <laughs> our economics. <laughs> through tithing <laughs> and through giving. <laughs> He wants to help us, not only in the 10%, but also how to manage the 90%. And he releases a river that increases our capacity to have our minds renewed to have our souls healed with an ability to stand before him and to say thank you God. In fact, I want to invite you to stand before him. We enter his gates with thanksgiving. Into his Stand in his courts with praise. And then we thank him and praise him again. <laughs> yes, Lord, we thank you this morning. We thank you for what you have restored. Lord, we see this morning how important worship is. And how central it is to our own life. We don't want to make the same mistakes that Adam and Eve made. Instead, we make our choices. And we look upon Jesus. We recognize what he did for us. What we couldn't do for ourselves. We ate the bread. We, we drank of the fruit of the grace. Symbols of your death. Offered up on our behalf. And, and, and we say thank you this morning. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for what you did for us. And that you opened a way to the Father that couldn't be opened in any other way. For you are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through you. You gave yourself so that you could bring us to the Father. Oh, thank you. Thank you for restoring that relationship. Father, we tell you this morning we love you. We need you this morning. I pray if there's anyone in this room today who feels distant, who is afraid, I pray right now we agree together. We resist that fear. And we command it in the name of Jesus. Go. Go. You are not my inheritance. Instead, I'm accepted. I'm loved beyond measure. And God is close to me. In fact, He's made His home. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Father. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, we pray for the church in Slovenia this morning. Help us to grow in our worship. As the body of Christ. As your sons and daughters. And we declare God's in the house. And when the Father is home. When all are aware that he is here. All the sons and daughters. Yes, Father. Father's in charge. Yeah, He determines the atmosphere. On the atmosphere of the Thank you, Father, that you are involved. That you are here today. That you are here for us. Lord, I pray for a new wisdom to be released. For us to manage hard situations. It seems to me that the deeper we go in, and when when God is developing things, there are there are newer challenges. Lord, you call us to be wise stewards. Skillful builders. Lord, we, we lay out our hands before you. And we acknowledge our dependence on you. We can't lead without you. We can't do anything without you. We acknowledge our trust upon you. And we need you today. Would you breathe upon us the breath, breath of life and cause your river to flow from your heart, from your heart to our hearts so that we do not lack what we need. Instead, we can rejoice as we co-labor with you in the fruits that you bring forth. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to invite your team to come back up, please.